Sometimes in Scripture, God uses animals to help make a point. For example, we're called sheep, and he's the shepherd. Uh, We've got Balaam's famous story of him and his talking donkey. Uh, We've got Jesus talking about the birds of the air and God taking care of them in Matthew uh, chapter 6. Isaiah talks about mounting up like wings like eagles, and David in the Psalms talks about the deer panting for the streams of water. But I wanted to tell you a personal story tonight about an animal that taught me a spiritual lesson. Uh, So back in college, uh, Megan and I had been dating for a while, and we thought it would be a great idea uh, to kind of help take our relationship to the next level and adopt a cat. Yeah, you can, uh, yeah. Um, So this was an all-black cat, so we named her Prada, and um, how it worked out was the cat would live with me and my roommates for a couple weeks, and then we'd ship the cat over to Megan, and she'd live at her apartment with uh, her roommates for a couple weeks. Um, And I remember this one day uh, specifically that it was just a normal day. Um, I was doing laundry uh, downstairs, and um, you know, nothing, nothing particularly uh, abnormal about this day. Um, and in the laundry room, we've got like this little short bookcase, and it had like all the cleaning supplies and soap and everything like that on it. And on the bottom shelf of the bookcase was the uh, the, the powdered like detergent that you use. So, so I'm sitting here doing my laundry, right? You know, I'm, I'm gathering the, the the laundry in big you know piles and dumping it in, um, and the cat kept trying to sneak its way over and stick its head in the laundry detergent. And, you know, while I'm trying to balance, like, this huge huge load of of clothes in my arms, I keep, you know, trying to shoo the cat away with my foot and, you know, get out of here. And this went on and on for at least, you know, three or four times. And, And I finally got to the point that I just put the laundry down, and, and I was like, fine, go ahead. Can't you tell that I'm doing this for your own good? And as soon as I heard these words come out of my mouth, this was kind of like one of those light bulb moments that, that we tend to have, that I was thinking, this has got to be what God feels like when, when he talks about me. You know, how many times over and over, um, you know, have I just done what I've wanted to do in life? Just, you know, being disregarding of, you know, if this was really sin or not. Um, and, and I started to think um, about God's patience. We think we know better than God sometimes. Um, you know, it really won't hurt me. It's just a little, you know, dot, 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 fill in the blank. Um, it's the oldest trick in the book, really. Um, if you turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3, uh, we can look at the, at the Eve and the serpent. Uh, in Genesis chapter 3, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of the tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Sometimes we feel that God is holding us back from pleasure, but he's really holding us back from pain. God really does want what's best for us, but do we really believe it? We say we do, but when it comes down to decision time, when rubber meets the road, What choice do you make? What choice do I make? God's patience is out of this world. There is no way my human patience could even come close to his. I had to shoo away my cat three times before I was literally ready to throw away the towel, uh, no, no pun intended, and let the cat do whatever it wanted. Look back at God's relationship with his children, the Israelites in the Old Testament. They cried out to God to deliver them from Pharaoh, and and he listened, and he provided a way out. But as they were fleeing and coming to the Red Sea, instead of trusting 
what do they say? So turn over to Numbers uh, chapter 14. We'll read verses 1 through 4. Numbers 14, uh, 1 through 4. It says, That night all the people of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in this desert. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, We should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. But God provided and parted the Red Sea and destroyed their enemies. However, more time goes by, and their trust in God's plans falls apart again. In uh, Exodus 32, uh, we've got the the story of the golden calf. Uh, It says, When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow, Moses, who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. We see in the scriptures that Israel has this back-and-forth relationship with God and idolatry. We studied uh, back a while the prophet uh, of Ezekiel on Wednesday nights. Um, If you want to turn over to Ezekiel chapter 16, uh, here we see God share his heart Uh, for his people, but how they reject him. Ezekiel chapter 16. It says, Again the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, make known to Jerusalem her abominations, and say, Thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, Your origin and your birth are of the land of the Canaanites. Your father was an Amorite, and your mother was a Hittite. And as for your birth, on the day you were born, your cord was not cut. Nor were you washed with waters to cleanse you, nor rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling clothes. No, I pitied you to do any of these things to you out of compassion for you, but you were cast out on the open field, for you were abhorred on the day that you were born. And when I passed by you, I saw you wallowing in your blood. I said to you in your blood, live. I said to you in your blood, live. I made you flourish like a plant of the field. And you grew up and became tall and arrived at full adornment. Your breasts were formed and your hair had grown, yet you were naked and bare. When I passed by you again and saw you, behold, you were at the age for love. And I spread the corner of my my garment over you and covered your nakedness. I made my vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, declared the Lord God, and you became mine. Then I bathed you with water and washed off your blood from you and anointed you with oil. I clothed you also with embroidered cloth and shod you with fine leather. I wrapped you in fine linen and and covered you with silk. And I adorned you with ornaments and put bracelets on your wrists and a chain on your neck. And I put a ring on your nose and earrings in your ears and a beautiful crown on your head. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver And your clothing was of fine linen and silk and embroidered cloth. You ate fine flour and oil, and and you ate fine flour and honey and oil. You grew exceedingly beautiful and advanced to royalty, and your renown went forth among the nations because of your beauty, for it was perfect through the splendor that I had bestowed on you, declares the Lord God. But you trusted in your beauty. And you played the whore because of your renown and lavish your whoring on any passerby. Your beauty became his. You took some of your garments and made for yourself colorful shrines, and on them played the whore. The like has never been, nor ever shall be. You also took your beautiful jewels of my gold and of my silver, which I gave you, and made for yourself images of men, and with them played the whore. And you took your embroidered garments to cover them and set my oil and my incense before them. Also my bread that I gave you, I fed you with fine flour and oil and honey. You set them before them for a pleasant aroma. And so it was, declares the Lord God, and you took your sons and daughters whom you had borne to me, and these you sacrificed to them to be devoured. You were whoring so small a matter that you slaughtered my children and delivered them up as an offering by fire to them. And all your 
And in all your abominations and your whorings did you not remember the days of your youth when you were naked and bare, wallowing in your blood. And after all your wickedness, woe, woe to you, declares the Lord God. I know that these verses are a little explicit, but these are the words that are supposed to be uncomfortable when we read them. This is the word picture painted by God. When you read this, can't you just hear God's heart breaking? He says, I took you in. I gave you all these blessings, and what did you do? You tried to find a love with relationships with everyone else but me. Paul talked this morning um, about husbands and wives and the relationship that they have. Um, and, you know, we can see that relationship here, too, you know, with adultery. That, that special relationship that you have, you know, with your spouse after you're married, and then just giving that away to everyone else except them. What pain that would give you in your heart. And that's what God's trying to relay here, is that's the love that he has for Israel, that that's his only bride. And he or she was just giving that love to everyone else. God wanted to give his people a visual aid of his heart towards Israel, and he used a man named Hosea. Hosea was the last to prophesy before the northern kingdom fell to Assyria in around 722 B.C. His ministry followed a golden age in the northern kingdom where peace and prosperity had not been seen since the days of Solomon. Unfortunately, with this prosperity came moral decay, and Israel forsook God to worship idols. So God instructed Hosea to marry a wife of Horam, whose unfaithfulness to her husband would serve as an example of Israel's unfaithfulness to God. Hosea then explained God's complaint against Israel and warned, warned of the punishment that would come unless the people returned to the Lord and remained faithful to him. The book shows the depths of God's love for his people and a love that tolerates no rivals. I want to read Hosea uh, chapter 11. Hosea chapter 11 starts, The Lord's love for Israel. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt I called my son. The more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the, sacrificing to the Baals and burning offerings to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up in their arms. But they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of kindness, with the bands of love, and I became to them as one who eases the yokes on their jaws. And I bent down to them and fed them. They shall not return to the land of Egypt, but Assyria shall be their king, because they have refused to return to me. The sword shall rage against their cities, consume the bars of their gates, and devour them because of their own consuls. My people are bent on turning away from me. And though they call out to the Most High, he shall not raise them up at all. How can I give up on you, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zebulun? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim. For I am God and not a man the Holy One, in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. God was so patient with Israel. Now, God did punish Israel for their disobedience, but he never closed off his heart. Remember what it says in Hebrews 12, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves. And he chastens everyone he accepts as a son. God has always been a God of love, a God of patience, and a God of long-suffering. And maybe you've made some bad choices. Maybe you, like a pendulum and the Israelites, have swayed from being close to God, falling away, being close, falling away. But he's still there like the prodigal son's father, just waiting for his child to return. He wants that relationship with you, but he's a jealous God. And it says in Exodus 20, verse 5, 
as it says in Exodus 20, verse 5. He won't play st second string. He won't be some genie just to call on whenever you're stuck. But he wants your heart. He wants the whole thing. He's been patiently waiting for you. So if you're ready to give your whole heart to God, um, now is the time in our service that we, we have set aside for that. We call it the invitation. Um, it's also a time, too, for those who are, who are believers that, you know, maybe you've been struggling in sin. Maybe there's something that you've been wrestling with. Maybe you feel far from God, uh, and you need the prayers of your brothers and sisters. So if any of you has a need, please come to the floor while we stand and sing.